the economic data delivers another downside surprise. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures down about two tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York coming up, the appetizer before the main event, ADP coming in soft. Fed officials signal rates above 5% through to year end. And UBS says Credit Suisse integration may take four years. We begin with the big issue, the data showing some cracks. We're in a slowing economy. You have a, you know, what is kind of a slowing economy. We see the cracks appearing. We have continued economic data that tells us to be cautious. You have some evidence of, of slowing in the economy. ISM manufacturing, we just had come out a couple of days ago. It's below 50 for five months running now. We're entering a period of higher economic volatility. We are hearing a lot of stories about folks who are bearish. Market skepticism uh, and pessimism is really hot. We're entering a world where it's just not as predictable. Rates have not risen this quickly since the early 1980s. We are seeing the financial cracks and the damages that are starting happening. We are going to see the impact of all of this in earnings. It's just going to be kind of a drip, drip, drip. The Fed is not going to bail you out. The economy is not going to bail you out. So we need to wait and see that. Joining us now to discuss Morgan Stanley's Andrew Slim and Matt Miskin of John Hancock. Gents, thanks for being with us. I want to come to you first, Matt. Matt, the data so far, ISM downside surprise. Jolt, downside surprise. ADP, downside surprise. Are these cracks anything to worry about? The bond market's telling you they should be. Uh, the two-year yield falling here. You know, I, last time we were on, John, we were talking about how the two-year yield's acting like a main stock. And it continues to do so, only now the volatility is to the downside, breaking 4%. The 10-year yield starting to really break support. That 340 was so heavy and hard to break. We're breaking that in the last two days here. So the bond market is definitely telling you that this economic weakness is legit and something to be focused on. The equity market hasn't woken up to it yet. We think that's the next story that's going to play out here in the next couple of months. Well, Andrew, let's talk about that. We started the week on a two-year 4.1%. Right now, 373. What's the signal you take from that, Andrew? Uh, the signal I take is the economy is weakening. The question is really is how much is that is embedded already in, in stock prices, and I think that's a different story. Do you think we're starting to price that in now, Andrew, based on the price action of yesterday? Finally, yeah, bad news sure. is kind of bad news. Yeah, well, look, I mean, look, Jonathan, if I had said to you at the beginning of the year, we're going to have a banking crisis, uh, the Fed's going to still raise rates, e economic data is going to be weak, uh, uh, earnings estimates continue to slide, uh, I think you'd say to me, oh, my God, all those bearish uh, strategists are going to be right, except the market's up 7%. I think <laughs> the reason for that is because the market has basically gone nowhere for two years. We had a horrible year last year, and sentiment follows price, and uh, sentiment is woefully bad. So that's why I think the bears are unbelievably frustrated, because the market is not uh, following this weakness yet. That doesn't mean necessarily a reason to be bullish, but I think that's why the market is hanging in there because a lot of this is embedded already over the last couple of years. Matt, what's more important, the Fed backing away or why the Fed might back away? I think the why is always more important, uh, but the Fed uses lagging economic data points. And it's just the way the system works, and they're going to be waiting for inflation for a long time. That shelter component is going to take a while to come down. And that's what's driving a lot of this inflation. And, and, you know, you talk to all these FOMC members, and they keep looking at lagging economic data points. And as a bond investor, as an investor, you got to think about what is the trend going forward, not what the Fed looks at going behind in the rearview mirror. And in our view, the leading economic indicators are already negative. The data is just starting to show, the, the co coincident lagging data is just starting to show what the leading indi indicators have told you for months. And so that's what you got to position for. We think high-quality bonds are an opportunity here. And Matt, this is a difficult moment for a lot of people. At the moment, we haven't seen how the banking shock translates into economic data. There just seems to be a bias. If the data is resilient, ignore it. If it's bad, embrace it, because there's a belief at the moment that's the direction of travel. Connor Senna, Bloomberg Opinion, out on Twitter. 
after that ADP report said this, the economy is guilty until proven innocent in the eyes of fixed income investors at the moment. I'd say, Matt, perhaps the move of this morning speaks to that, doesn't it? I, I love that quote. The only thing I would say is it's all about context in the economic cycle. The yield curve has been inverted for six months. It's not like you know this is a new thing that all of a sudden the economy is weakening is, is a surprise. The Fed had you know one of the most increasing of interest rates in modern history other than the 1980s. You shouldn't be surprised that when the Fed jacks up interest rates this fast that eventually it slows down the economy. So I, I agree. I love the quote. But the thing is, with context of given what the, where we are in the cycle, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise. Quite a turnaround in the Treasury market this morning. Yields were higher by five, six basis points on a two-year, now lower by nine basis points, 374. A bit more economic data a little bit later this morning. The ISM services read comes out in about 55 minutes' time. We caught up with one Fed official a little bit earlier this morning. Take a listen. My own view is that we'll have to go above 5%, but exactly how much, precisely how much, and precisely how long it has to stay above, we've got to be open. We have a lot more data to get to. The economy is going to tell us where it wants us to get to. And Mike McKee, the market believes what the market believes, and Loretta Mester has her own opinion. She said the same thing that other Fed officials, including Jay Powell, have said. Markets have a different job than I do. They have to take in all of the data and figure out what the best course for policy is. And all of the data still outstanding. We're going to be getting a lot more as the week goes on. We already got this ADP number now. Uh, as Mester said, it's another data point. Uh, a lot of people uh, put it down. It, it did show 145,000. But over the last uh, year, ADP has almost in every month undershot what the non-farm payrolls number is. So there is that if you're trying to use it to adjust your forecasts. Uh, the forecasts are still for strong growth of 240,000 and 3.6 percent unemployment. The idea is uh, average hourly earnings will come down a little bit. But when you look at the numbers in ADP, 98,000 jobs were created, they say, in the leisure and hospitality sector, which is generally lower paid. Construction had 35,000. That's uh, higher paid jobs. So it's be interesting to see how the breakdown comes down because, as Mester said, she is still very concerned about inflation. And uh, finally, of course, there's the dispute between the Fed and the markets that we've been talking about. The markets, as you can see, pricing in four rate cuts by January of next year. And of we were talking earlier about how the two-year has really cratered today. And the Fed, of course, thinks it's going to go up once more and hold all year. And uh, according to Loretta Mester, um, the Fed is more likely to do that than they are to adopt the market's view. But she said it's going to take the data to show which side is right. Mike McKee, thanks for that. Fantastic conversation, as always. We'll catch up with you later this hour. We get some PMI data, some ISM stuff a little bit later in about 50 minutes or so. Andrew Slimman, I want to come to you on the relationship between the bond market and equities. You mentioned the year-to-date performance in stocks. Great performance if you're looking at the Nasdaq. That happened with a bond market that was rallying. Do you expect that to change? Just the correlation, correlation between the two in the coming months? Well, I think lower yields is good for growth stocks. It's not good for value stocks. So that's what we're seeing is we're seeing a rotation uh, away from the cyclical stocks into many of the growth stocks that got crushed last year. So again, this is a story, in my opinion, of what was hit last year hard is, is starting to come back. So I think lower yields is good for parts of the market, but it's not good for the cyclical stocks. We certainly saw that yesterday with some of the industrials really getting, getting hit hard. So I think there is a rotation uh, going on in the market. I just, I would be just very cautious on uh, some of the stocks are pricing in a very dire outcome, and I'm just not sure. You know, Matt mentioned the yield curve inverted six months ago. Why in the heck is the stock market higher? If you look at the history of when the invert yield curve inverts and it starts to uninvert, usually the stock market is at a high when that happens. It's not, you know, back to where it was two years ago. So again, the question is what's in price into the stocks? And I think that's why lower yields is helping growth stocks. Well, it's the bull steepener we should be worried about, isn't it, Andrew, when you start to price in a rate cutting cycle like we have done in the last month? No question about that. But again, look at the history of that and look at how the market's done the previous 12 months when that starts to happen. 
it's generally done very well. It hasn't been weak the way it is now. Are we litigating the last 12 months or making a judgment about the next 12? Well, that's right. I mean, so again, all I care about is what embedded in stock prices, and I think that's why mega cap tech stocks are rallying because they were down so much last year. I have a hard time, again, justifying them at these prices. So it's not, I'm not saying the market's going to break to the upside. But all I'm saying is this is why we keep throwing bad news at the market and it doesn't really crack because it's a lot of is embedded. But the longer the market hangs in there, eventually we're going to price a recovery next year. And I think that will be bullish, but it's far too early. Matt Miskin, I sense from you we've got to price a recession before we price a recovery. Exactly. I mean, the order of operations is every time the cycle looks at that inverted yield curve, the leading economic indicators go negative. We hit that recession, as you said, bull steepener, the Fed cuts, and then we start a new cycle. You know, you got to wait for those things to pass one by one. And right now we're, we're still in that late cycle environment, not in the recession yet. The unemployment rate, you know, this initial jobless claims, this job support, I know everybody hypes up every single one, but it is. If, if you start to see real cracks in the jobs data, that is usually the catalyst of the recession signal and the Fed to cut. And if that happens the next couple months, it's going to happen fast. And again, in the high quality bond market, it's going to move before the Fed tells you. You've got to be there before that happens. And that's why, again, that's one of our highest conviction calls cross asset today. Matt Miskin, Andrew Slimman, sticking with us. We'll pick up on the banks in just a moment. Amazing to see the South Side on the same page at the moment. Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. That wasn't a story over the previous 12 months. This was Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. We see little evidence that a new bull market has begun and believe the bear still has unfinished business. Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan said this. Any decline in yields is not a sign that the Fed is about to bring a punch bowl for tech stocks, in our view, but rather a sign that recession probability has increased. We expect a reversal in risk sentiment and the market retesting last year's low over the coming months. That's the call from Marco and JP Morgan. The call right now, equities down, two tenths of one percent on the S&P, about 20 minutes out from the opening bell. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, let's lift the lid a little bit and take a look at what's happening beneath the surface. Starting off with the shares of FedEx, they are popping this, of course, on the news that they are restructuring. They're planning on merging their two units, essentially, to save $4 billion, the express packages and its ground unit, similar to UPS. Johnson & Johnson up nearly 3%. They're finally settling the talc lawsuits and paying roughly $8.9 billion to settle those lawsuits. Walmart roughly flat. They've maintained their guidance in a virtual investment community meeting. This after cutting roughly 2300 e-commerce warehouse jobs uh, yesterday that announcement came out and then picking back up on the bank story Western Alliance down 10.2 percent they've provided a financial update the fourth since March 10th this is the first without news on deposit balances Jeffrey's saying that investors could take this as bad news and then sticking with the banks UBS barely moving over in European trading well actually now it's down a bit more than it had been down about eight tenths of one percent the integration of credit seats well as you were mentioning John it could take four years it seems as though investors are maybe fretting about what that could mean an overhang over the years. Abby, thanks for that. Coming up on the program, UBS addressing shareholders. This transaction is the first merger of two global systemically important banks. This is not in any way an easy deal to do and brings with it significant execution risk. That conversation up next. Integration of our businesses is expected to take three to four years, excluding the full wind down of the Credit Suisse Investment Bank's non core portfolio. We expect the transaction to generate an annual run rate cost reduction of more than 8 billion US dollars by 2027. What a couple of weeks for Swiss banking. UBS facing shareholders after its historic takeover of Credit Suisse. The bank's chair warning of a long road ahead as Sergio and Motti returns to the helm. Bloomberg reporting the groundwork had already been laid for years. When Colm Kelleher took the reins as chairman, he, quote, inherited studies by his predecessor dating back to at least 2020 on what a takeover of Credit Suisse would look like. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny joins us now from Basel, Switzerland for more. Manus, that's the look back. What's the message going forward? The message going forward was 
get ready for a transition that's going to take a considerable period of time. I think there's two transitions we need to talk about. One is the integration process, three to four years. Maybe Callagher was setting the benchmark a little bit low for us so that they can outperform. I think the much more important is about when they get their full access to the full books of Credit Suisse and the level three exposures. They are on the hook for the first five billion. Then you've got the state on the hook for the next nine billion. Now the question is this, how quickly will it take for Callagher and Armati, more so Armati and the team on a day to day basis, to run down those risk weighted assets that they don't want? Armati has skill in that game, in that he did it post Lehman and post GFC, and so too has Callagher. Absolutely phlegmatic performance, dare I say it, for the Irish today. Well, Manus, you can say it as an Irishman. Manus, thank you for joining us and great coverage over the last couple of weeks. Manus Cranny on the latest. That's the latest on UBS. We need to talk about US banking as well. On April 13th, First Republic. On April 14th, JP Morgan reports. Andrew Slim and Matt Miskin back with us. Matt, do you think potentially that bank earnings might be more important than payrolls on Friday and CPI on the 12th? Absolutely. Right now, the, the street's looking for double digit, if on 15% earnings growth uh, from the financial sector in 2023. And that just seems really optimistic for us. Uh, we actually see them, the corporate guidance coming down. You know, you rewind over the first quarter, and if the, if the FDIC and Yellen hadn't stepped in when they did, John, and, and saved SVB, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be in a much different world today. I remember Jim Bianco, you know, tweeting all weekend. You couldn't even take a break on the weekend, given how much <laughs> news has been flying through on all the banking. You know, and, and just think about that. If they didn't spend $300 billion backing that up, we'd be in a totally different place. And I think the banking earnings, so solvency risk might be a little bit less than it was, but earnings risk is coming up next on financials. We would look to underweight that part of the market. And Andrew, it's not just the financials themselves and the earnings risk for that industry group. It's also about what that industry group does in the coming weeks and months and how that shapes the economy. Andrew, what will you use bank earnings for next week? Well, I, I, don't, I, I see no upside in the banks because if they report good numbers, which I doubt, uh, people say, yeah, but it's going to be weak. And if they report bad numbers, the, the stocks will go down. So. I don't see, I think the risk for a lot of these cyclical areas is even if they report good earnings, the market's going to say, yeah, but we're going to look through that. So that's why I think there's a rotation back into some of the steadier growth areas. What I would say about overall earnings season as an equity portfolio manager, you always want to go into equity season with low expectations. Things are going to be bad. And that's been the story really for about a year now. Uh, predictions of bad earnings season, and it turns out not to be, it never has been good, hasn't been good, but it's not been as bad, and the markets have rallied. So the setup is, again, better, because what gets me nervous is when expectations are sky high. But for these cyclical areas, I just don't see an outcome that's necessarily bullish, because I think even if they report good numbers, the market's just going to look right through it. Matt, what kind of guidance can they provide? We've talked about the Federal Reserve, the meeting on May 3rd, Will they, won't they have sufficient information to make the call to hike interest rates? What have these banks got to go on based on what we've seen over the last month? Yeah, I mean, loan growth, uh, write-offs, you know, basically if they're seeing the consumer isn't able to pay back the loans at the, the current clip uh, into the first quarter, I think if they say they have to have more reserves uh, going into the rest of the year, that'll be a tell. You know, and, and they're just going to try to show their hand and, and say, look, we've got to be realistic here. If you're looking for double digit earnings growth this year, that's not going to be attainable. Uh, so I think they can bring it down. You know, and I think Andrew's right. You know, overall earnings estimates for 20 uh, for this first quarter is negative 7 percent on the S&P 500. That is that's pretty dire. But the thing is, in the back half, the, uh, the street's looking for this massive recovery. I think that's what the corporate guidance could actually bring that down. And that would actually result in a re-rating of stocks. Matt, Andrew's told us what would, he likes would, and doesn't like I, in the equity market. Matt, just to come back to you quickly, Matt, you haven't told yeah. me what you do like in the equity market. What is it? We've been all, you know, t quality is, is the factor we would focus on, you know, higher ROE, better balance sheet companies. I know it's, it's come out of the gate strong to start this year, but we still think late cycle into a potential recession. You want to be balance sheet strong companies as an emphasis. That's a quality factor. That is technology and healthcare as primary sectors there. I know the valuations are a bit rich, 
but the earnings estimates on tech are negative half a percent for the year. And for CD and financials, it's like 10 to 20 percent. So the earnings estimates are lower in some of these quality parts of the market. I think that's often overlooked in valuation analysis, and you really got to incorporate that in your outlook. Andre, jump in. Sure. First of all, one thing I would add about financials that Matt didn't mention is valuation is a reason to be optimistic. Valuation is very, very cheap. But I, 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 I think if the areas that I would focus on, I think energy is very intriguing. You know, it went from university love to last year very popular to really falling out of bed, one of the worst performing sectors. And yet, you know, rig count hasn't gone up or energy prices have stabilized. And I think, you know, you can get pretty good dividend yields in some of these energy areas. So I would marry that a little bit more cyclical, maybe a semiconductor with some more defensive, which Matt uh, mentioned, uh, just in case, you know, that, that, that the, the next leg is lower. I, again, tend to disagree that the market has substantial downside, but I don't think right now there's a reason for optimism with a lot of upside. I think it's a wait and see. So I'd like to barbell a strategy right now. Matt, final word. You know, I, I think the 10-year Treasury yield, the two-year Treasury yield is really what we're watching. And high-quality bonds, high-quality income should be an emphasis in portfolios. Big move right there. That's for sure this morning. Down another nine basis points. 373, 374 in a two-year. Matt Miskin, Andrew Sliman to the two of you. Thank you. Coming up on this program, the morning calls and later, the case for owning fixed income, where BlackRock's Marilyn Watson is staying long duration. That conversation just around the corner. Equity futures this morning, seven minutes out from the opening bell, negative two-tenths of 1%. Back to bad news is bad news. About five minutes out from the opening bell, equity futures down just a little bit by a quarter of 1%. That's the equity story. Here's the bond market picture. Take a look at the two year. Starts the week at about 4.1%. ADP report, downside surprise. ISM, downside surprise. Jolts, downside surprise. Yields, lower by another eight basis points, pulling all the way back to about 374 on twos. That's the picture of the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Argus upgrading Meta to buy, expecting the company's deep cost cuts to boost profitability. That stock's down about a third of 1%. Raymond James upgrading United Health to a strong buy, seeing a positive setup as policy headwinds fade. That stock positive by nine tenths of 1%. And finally, UBS upgrading First Citizens Bank to buy from sell, saying the company's balance sheet is now positioned to handle a possible recession. That stock's up by nine tenths of 1%. Coming up, Western Alliance failing to impress investors with its latest update. That conversation just around the corner with BlackRock's Marilyn Watson. That stock is down about 10%. Equity futures more broadly softer by two tenths. You're open and bow just around the corner. Two seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you all. Snapped a four-day winning streak on the S&P 500 in yesterday's session. Believe it or not, the longest winning streak on the S&P going back to January. Equity futures going into the open. Negative two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about a third of 1%. Weak data driving another leg lower in yields this morning. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. We look a little something like this. Yields lower by three basis points on 10s. 3.30 on twos. Down almost 10 basis points in the last 30 minutes or so on a two-year yield. I can tell you the two-year right now in the U.S. is down about nine basis points to 3.74. Euro dollar just south of 110, 109.43, down a tenth of 1%. And crude just about holding on to 80. $80 and about 70 cents. We're down almost a tenth of 1%. About 20 seconds into the session, a broader equity market on the S&P. No drama. Down around about two tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq, down by four tenths of 1%. One stock to watch at the open. GM, the company buying out 5,000 employees to avoid forced layoffs. That's 6% of its global workforce. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, you know, it's really interesting here because, of course, one of the big themes over recent months is corporate America, big companies cutting jobs. And this is interesting because these don't count as cuts because, to your point, what you just said, these are voluntary buyouts. GM is eliminating 5,000 uh, staffers to basically save $1 billion annually. But, again, these are voluntary buyouts. They, they aren't officially cuts along the lines of what we've heard from so many other companies, perhaps Amazon being a bit of the uh, poster 
Fairchild for these cuts. Now, relative to another company this week that has cut positions, Walmart, they also are providing an investor day, uh, an investor update. They have maintained guidance. What we're looking at here in white is the stock in blue, the EPS. And if you recall earlier uh, this year, and many times they've cut guidance and it's been a bit me messy. So the blue line you can see going down from 660 to, to 614. That's still uh, the that is well Wall Street estimate. The guidance that Walmart has maintained is actually below that. The stock right now about even perhaps having to do with some of the color they provided in terms of uh, maintaining uh, the fact that their U.S. supply chain and inventories are in better shape. Now let's tie it all together because of course GM cutting Walmart yesterday cutting about 2,300 uh, warehouse jobs automation coming in. But the big one this week, John, it of course is McDonald's. They have their corporate staff at home Monday through today as workers find out how many of uh, the corporate staff is eliminated. They've been eliminating since 2018. They had been at 235,000 corporate staffers uh, globally. Now at 150. A tough way to go, John. Abby, thanks for that. That's the latest on those names. Let's get to the airlines. This is from Jefferies, cutting their earnings estimates on the airlines and writing the following. OPEC has put immediate pressure to the upside on crude prices. We adjust our numbers for Q2 and beyond. Second quarter EPS estimates dropped by 11%. They've now got full year estimates on the airlines falling 12%. That's the latest from Jefferies a little bit earlier. Here's one sector to watch elsewhere, the chip makers. Japan's decision to join the US in curbing exports to China weighing on the semiconductor stocks. Katie Greifeld has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, yeah, the chip sector broadly under pressure today after those comments from China, which came just a few days after China warned Japan not to participate in U.S. efforts to suppress China's semiconductor industry. You can see that AMD and Intel among some of the chip names that are falling today, as is NVIDIA, which, of course, is one of this year's best performing stocks. You add that all together and you have the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index just a hair lower as trading kicks off. And arguably of the big benchmarks, the Sox has the most to fall here. As you can see from October's low, that index has surged more than 40 percent. That compares to a 21 percent gain for the Nasdaq 100 and a pedestrian 14 percent climb for the S&P 500. And John, if you take a look at the ETF flows, which is my favorite thing to do, you're looking at SMH here. That is VanEck's $7.5 billion chips fund. It's posted three straight weeks of outflows despite that outperformance. So investors potentially starting to cool on chips here. Katie, thanks for the color there. The broader market three, four minutes into the session. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down four tenths of 1%. Big rally in the bond market over the last couple of days off the back of weak data. Yields are down by eight or nine basis points to the front end, the two year. 374. Let's get to the banks. UBS confronting shareholders at its general meeting. The chairman expecting integration of Credit Suisse to take up to four years. Jan Patrick Barnett joins us now from Frankfurt. Jan Patrick, we know, according to head the headlines, that this was thrown together in a couple of days. But we also know, based on experience, that this has been talked about in Switzerland for years. Do they know what this is going to look like in the years to come? Absolutely. And we also learned today that UBS had a top secret plan among its top executives. Uh, if ever would a, a merger with Credit Suisse come up, they had this in the drawer. And that explains to some degree uh, why they were able to pull this off in, in just a weekend. We learned it will take a long time. So investors need to be patient up to four years, we learned today. And that's not even including the wind down of the investment bank. And they also told us that Credit Suisse going forward will not be an independent uh, uh, company. So that's another detail we got there. Um, more details are uh, still an open question, but I'm sure that UBS will be keen to tell us tell us more about this. What we also learned today, and that was very surprising to me, uh, is that the Swiss government considered a bankruptcy of Credit Suisse instead of merging them uh, with UBS. And I think we can all be very happy that they didn't opt for this for this option because the chaos resulting from that would probably have been much, much worse than now a tricky merger. I do wonder how much of the weekend was actually dedicated to that idea, though. Jan Patrick, thank you. Jan Patrick Barnett. There on the latest for UBS. In the US, shares of Western Alliance falling as a lack of details about its deposit balance weighs on the stock. That stock's Chanali down about 9%. It's certainly a beating that it's taken here. This is a stock that has showed jitters, John, all year long. Not as much as some other banks like PacWest or First Republic, but you're seeing the stock drop much more on a statement it made today. Some of the positive news within that statement was that insured deposits as a percentage of its balances had grown and that the uninsured deposits, as shown by Bloomberg Intelligence's own analysis, is that they have enough liquidity here to cover 140% of the uninsured deposits. They didn't borrow 
really from the discount window here. They don't have balances outstanding at the very least uh, in terms of their exposure there. But here's the problem. They didn't give an update on that deposit balance story. Now, this is going to be a very, very, very messy two weeks ahead as we watch the regional banks start to report because the question is, what is bad news in terms of deposit outflows when we already know here that the smaller banks have seen many according to Federal Reserve data. Now, look at how, just how skeptical the market is about the bank stocks in particular. The earnings yields here of about 13.5% is much, much higher than the premium you're getting in the S&P 500, more than 800 basis points, John. According to Bloomberg's analysis, that is about two decades worth of uh, the highest you've seen of a premium for bank stocks in about two decades here. So you have to wonder here if the sell-off is warranted and whether the next two weeks will bring more volatility for these stocks. That's Western Alliance. Shanali, we need to talk about next week, bank earnings. And I think it's right to talk about it right now. The 13th First Republic, the 14th, I think, JP Morgan. Shanali, what's going to stand out for you next week? Everything about First Republic, there's a huge question about. That is an estimated date that we expect to see their earnings. Are they going to announce at that time? Are they going to have any news like Western Alliance that they would announce beforehand? Do we hear from the government even before that? Just a week ago, we were talking about potential extraordinary measures. Has their deposit outflow stabilized? But then you have the big banks to the point that you're making. And how much business have they gained in this time frame to make really Wall Street comfortable that the big banks are the safer bet. I think the last time they gave earnings it was a triple digit stock and right now it's just about holding on to double figures. Shanali, thank you. Your broader equity market right now about seven or eight minutes into the session and the equity market on the S&P 500 just slightly softer down a little more than a tenth of one percent. Pimco's Aaron Brown saying the risk from the banking fallout still remain. I do think we're going to have more drips of this as we move through the rest of this year. Given the amount of extreme, you know, and the, and the rapidity of, of extreme tightening that we saw last year, I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of hidden risks under the surface, which are going to come to a bubble as we start to see more time proceed and as we head closer and closer to recession. Joining us now to discuss BlackRock's Marilyn Watson. Marilyn, good to see you and welcome to the program as always. Marilyn, the ISM manufacturing consecutively, five consecutive months. We've had sub-50 readings. Should we be pricing in a recession right now? Um, I think in the short term, um, it's too early to price in a recession, certainly in the first half of this year. When you look at the data, it has been very, very mixed. If you look at the, uh, the jobs data then this week, then um, although it has deteriorated a little bit, we still see you know, 1.7 openings for every one unemployed person. Um, so I think the data is still very mixed. I think as we move forward going into the second half of this year, um, the outlook does deteriorate. We do expect economic activity to gradually deteriorate. Um, and inflation does, of course, remain sticky. So we expect the Fed to hike rates probably one more time and then pause. Because I think now, um, as, you're, you know, as you heard from your previous guests, um, I think we do have an extraordinary high level of uncertainty in the markets. When you look at um, you know, the different market events that we've seen, as we've seen, you know, central banks kept rates incredibly low for such a long time. There was a huge amount of stimulus, a huge amount of uh, liquidity. And then with this rapid rate rise that we've seen over the past year or more, then now we're starting to see some of the consequences as, of that as well. So I think the data is, is very tricky. And I think now the central banks, the Fed in particular, um, are really facing a very delicate balance where they're trying to judge um, you know, and anticipate data coming forward as we have the lagged effects of uh, previous monetary policy. But also we continue to see the pass through from geopolitical events and other events as well. So we do think that in the second half of the year, uh, the data will deteriorate, but it's a very fine balance about when and if we do have a recession. As you anticipate that weaker data, Marilyn, selectively, where do you want to take duration risk at the moment, just globally? Yeah, so globally. So in the, in the US, we continue to really like um, very high quality um, assets that have little if no interest rate risk. So we like short dated commercial paper where you get very attractive carry for very little or no interest rate risk. We do also have some positioning at the front end of the Treasury curve. 
Um, as, as I mentioned, we think that maybe one more hike and then the Fed might be done. Um, elsewhere, globally, we, in, we do have a long position, a long duration position in the UK. That's primarily at the front end. It's a position that we've had for some time. But again, we think that the, that the Bank of England may hike one more time. But then based on their forward-looking expectations for both growth and inflation, we think that the Bank of England will probably pause after that as well. And then elsewhere in the Eurozone, uh, we're long Spain. We like the liquidity and the carry that that offers. We do think that the ECB will you know, hike rates again at their next meeting, and then they're incredibly data dependent as well. Um, I would say really the outlier that we have in terms of the central, or well, major central banks is in Japan, where we yep. continue, continue to have a short duration position and we're also long the yen. I think the meeting this, this month will be really, really interesting and really key. When we hear the tone set by the new governor, we'll see if any changes are made to the incredibly loose monetary policy that they have there, especially given that inflation is, continues to accelerate in Japan as well. So we're short duration in, in Japan. So we have a, a, a range of positions, some, you know, some long duration positions um, in developed markets and then this short duration position in Japan. And we continue to selectively like assets um, that, they, that, again, that are high quality, short duration, or have little or no interest rate risk in the securitized assets um, and elsewhere in high quality um, investment grade corporate bonds. What kind of credit risk would you advocate for right now, Marilyn? So in terms of credit risk, um, so we're looking at very high quality because I think at the moment you're just really not rewarded for taking more credit risk, particularly when you think that in you know, some high quality corporate bonds, you're already getting five plus percent in terms of carry at the front end. So there's no need to go down, uh, go down this, the capital stack essentially. Um, and the risks are there as we've seen with um, you know, events in the banking sector and elsewhere. I think you know, liquidity is becoming trickier in the market. Uh, we're seeing that you know, financing and the credit accessed by um, different companies is becoming difficult or more, you know, more expensive for them to obtain as well. I think it will be key to look at uh, the next earnings round and also not only um, you know, their earnings now, but also in terms of their forecast going forward as well. So I think we are at this key point where you know, debt has become a lot more expensive over the past year. And now we're really looking to see where we can see value in that and where we will continue to see value as um, economic data does gradually deteriorate. Marilyn, thank you for the perspective on the bond market as always. Marilyn Watson there of BlackRock. About 13 minutes into the session for the equity market, we are soft about a tenth of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq down by about a half of 1%. That softness in the Nasdaq, even with this move in the bond market, yields lower by nine basis points, 373 on a two-year. Downside surprise on the ISM, same thing on the jolts, same thing on the ADP report a little bit early this morning. Coming up, some more economic data. We have to look at all the data. We're going to use that to assess not only where the economy has been, but where it's going. Mike McKee will break down the latest next. This is Bloomberg Zee Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Kia, Kia Motor COO Steve Center. That's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. We have to look at all the data. We're going to get the employment report on Friday. I think it's wrong to think like, oh, we're looking only in the rearview mirror at data that's from a month ago or two months ago. That data is actually helpful for looking at trends. And then we also uh, augment that with other data about what's really happening on the ground, on Main Street. Great conversation with the Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester there and Mike McKee a little bit earlier this morning. You can catch that in full on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal as well. Some economic data across the Bloomberg about five minutes ago. Mike McKee has more. Hey, Mike. Hey, John. Uh, this is a picture of where the U.S. economy might be right now. The S&P Global U.S. Services PMI comes in at 52.6, down from 53.8. 
and that is also lower than the forecast. The composite at 52.3 down a uh, point from 53.3. Uh, it is also lower than the expectation. These numbers uh, measure business at uh, smaller, more export-oriented uh, firms in the United States. We get the ISM services number at the top of the hour. That's expected to also fall, and that'll uh, have much more market impact, John. That's another downside surprise, though, Mike McKee. On it's top of the ones we've yeah. had earlier this week. Yeah, and the question becomes for, for Wall Street and for the Fed, is this the kind of slowdown the Fed is wanting to see, or does it portend something worse? This ahead of the ISM, which Mike McKee's going to break down in about 12 minutes' time, and Guy Johnson's going to talk about with his colleague Alex Steele. I'm looking forward to that coverage. Guy joins us right now. Guy, the data in the U.S. soft. Over in Europe, it's not bad at all. Guy, in fact, we're talking about Eurozone exceptionalism for all the right reasons for once. Yeah, the data are OK, John. Um, you take a look at the, the composite PMIs that we had out today. Yes, there's a little dip off the flash number uh, down to 53.7. But these are still strong data. Let me just give you a point of comparison. Um, a year ago, this number was at 54.9. So we've dipped a little bit, but not by much. It's the highest reading since May 2022. New orders also tick higher. So the data is looking good uh, at the moment. I was talking to ING yesterday. Their view is that maybe actually the soft data really aren't telling us the real picture here, that the soft data can deteriorate really quickly. These kinds of survey numbers that we get with the PMIs can deteriorate very, very quickly, John. And it's going to be the data we get in kind of June time, June, July, uh, is really going to potentially knock the hawks off their perch. That is when the Eurozone economy is going to roll over, they think. But at the moment, the data aren't supporting that. And we even got a slightly better reading today on German industrials as, as well, German industrial production, uh, which paints a slightly more positive picture, though, like the United States, the industrial side of the economy not doing as well as the services side. So, guys, central banks worldwide tell us they're not in the business of providing guidance, and then they go on to provide us guidance. The Federal Reserve has said 5.1%. That's the median dot. A lot of Fed officials are sort of going around that number, coalescing around it and saying one more hike. We're going to stay there the rest of the year. What's the guidance coming from the ECB, which, of course, guy does not provide guidance? No, but individual members have the uh, capacity to be able to give us some idea of where we're going. Uh, I think the hawks are beginning to become a little less hawkish. That certainly seems to be the tone. Uh, we're getting towards the, uh, the end of the cycle. The bulk of the, uh, the hiking cycle is done. I think the real question, John, is at the moment the market has got the Fed pausing and potentially cutting and then the ECB kind of pausing during that period. And the real question is... Is the Fed going to save the ECB from a policy mistake, i.e. the ECB won't go as far as maybe it wants to because the Fed's already in cutting mode? And I'm just wondering how the narrative between the two central banks are going to work. The guidance at the moment is there is further to go. There is further distance to travel in terms of bringing inflation down to target. But I think if the Fed turns tail as the market is currently pricing, the ECB may struggle to deliver some of the hikes that the market is currently looking for. Guy, looking forward to your coverage in about nine minutes' time. Guy Johnson, alongside Alex Steele, don't miss that. The ISM Services Index coming out. Mike McKee's going to break that down with them. So far this week, downside surprise on the ISM manufacturing, downside surprise on jolts. There's some nuance there, and we can talk about that through the week. Downside surprise on the ADP. Now, we are, of course, told repeatedly that the ADP doesn't matter, doesn't tell you what the payrolls is going to do, and then immediately after the ADP report comes out, we trade on it, and we're trading on it this morning, a little bit anyway. We're down about eight basis points on a two-year. Let's call it 375 there on twos, on tens. We're down by two basis points to about 332 on a two-year. About 22 minutes into the session, the equity market down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down six or seven tenths of 1% with some sector price action. Here's Abby. John, some very interesting sector action today. If we take a look at the S&P 500 and what is happening, we have more sectors that are lower, but the key sectors that are lower, discretionary and tech. Tech now down for a third day in a row, the longest losing streak since February 22nd. It's not entirely clear what's behind it because yields are lower, but because yields are lower, I find this to be fascinating as someone who loves sectors. Utilities up 1.4%, healthcare up 1%, staples up seven tenths of 1%. Those the high dividend, the dividend rich sectors. So when yields are lower, those dividends look better. But let's take a look at the banks because with regional banks back in the spotlight uh, this week, now down three days in a row, it's not a huge loss, down about 3.9%, but it is the first three day streak since the uh, crisis first emerged uh, earlier in March. Those Jamie Dimon comments and of course Western Alliance today, the deposit, the lack of information there seems to be weighing. So those banks on the year, John, down 29%, the worst year ever since the key. 
RE came into conception, inception in 2007. Abby, thanks for that. The week ahead's just amazing. Look at the calendar. Tomorrow, we've got jobless claims, Friday payrolls, then on to next week, Wednesday CPI, the day after that, the bank earnings start to come through. A lot to discuss. Up next, your trading diary. It's all about the data. A string of economic data misses stateside over the last three days or so. Dragging the equities down just a little bit, down a tenth on the S&P, down about six tenths on the Nasdaq, and pushing in a decent bid into the bond market, yields lower, twos tenths, thirties this morning. Your two-year, down about seven basis points, 375. That's the story in the bond market. Let's get to the trading diary. The ISM Services Index at the top of the hour. Don't miss that. Speaker McCarthy meeting Taiwan's president at 1 p.m. Eastern. Another round of claims coming tomorrow morning. Plus, we'll hear from the St. Louis Fed president, Jim Bullard, as well. And finally, it's the main event the payrolls report just around the corner, looking for something in and around 240, according to our survey. From New York City, thanks for choosing Bloomberg TV. That does it for me. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Yeah.